Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Jeremiah Roberts, one of the co-hosts here at Cultish. Believe it or not, we are at the end of the year again. It's the end of 2022. Uh, We're so thankful for all of you who have supported us this past year. We are a completely crowdfunded, listener-supported ministry. But as of right now, of everyone who listens in to our content, both on our podcast and our YouTube, we only have roughly less than 1% of those who give, those who donate. So it goes to say that the only way the colleges can continue to next year is that we do need uh, to get support. By the end of the year, we're trusting God with that. So please, prayerfully consider go to going to the Cultist Show dot com. There is a donate tab. You can donate one time or become a monthly partner with us. Help us to become continue to be salt and light. We are headed into our fifth year of broadcasting and also headed into 2023, a brand new year, brand new topics, brand new challenges. The dot com. You can go to the donate tab. There is a one time or monthly donation you can commit yourself to help us go into 2023 to allow weekly content like this to continue. And thank you so much for supporting this past year. Now, enjoy this podcast. All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Coltish, Entering the Kingdom of the Colts. My name is Jeremiah Roberts, one of the co-hosts here. Uh, I'm joined by Andrew, the super sleuth of the show, and your super secret headquarters. Good to have you back for part two of chapter two. Thank you, man. I'm, I'm excited. This is a... It's been years in the process to get this episode going, these the series actually going, and I'm I think it's great, and I can't wait to do more, right? More of this uh, content discussing the Seventh Day. Adventist, yes, Adventist, so we are so, sort yeah. of recreating a great controversy of our own, uh, pun intended. <laughs> uh, we are joined back by Colleen Nikki. Thank you for coming back here. Thank you well, for having us. Thanks for having Excellent. us. Excellent. Before we jump in, just real quickly, where can people find you uh, with your ministry? Tell us, tell everyone real quickly about that. Uh, you can find us at proclamationmagazine.com, and there are links there to all kinds of material that will help. Okay, excellent. And so we were kind of talking, this series, chapter two, is called Is Seventh-day Adventism a Cult? Uh, we are uh, in part chapter one. Definitely check that out. If for some reason, you're jumping on in this episode for the very first episode. Uh, you can listen to it, but it might be good to get context, listen to the, the past three episodes, including the first chapter. We were talking about Ellen G. White, the Millerites, kind of giving that linear timeline to kind of explain how Seventh-day Adventism came together. Uh, in the second one, we've been talking about, uh, the second chapter, we've been talking about uh, Walter Martin, his relationship with uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and also talking about the book Questions on Doctrine, which was sort of a accumulation of what they cl- uh, clarified uh, with Walter Martin, and we kind of explained that in chapter one. So let me go ahead and I'm just going to go ahead and play uh, this clip so we can continue uh, the conversation. Really, we're going to have our own questions on doctrine, uh, specifically (laughs) with uh, the Seventh-day Adventism, what they believe. But we're going to use this clip uh, from the John Ankerberg Show as a catalyst uh, into part two. So again, this clip is about three three minutes, 45 seconds, but it's important to listen uh, to give context. Uh, Actually... Yeah, let's go ahead and just play the clip, and we'll uh, be back with you shortly. Plunge in here, Walter. Uh, uh, why don't you maybe start us off with some of the questions that you have already submitted to the, uh, the denomination, because you are saying that uh, you've heard some things, and you are reassessing what you were told the first time around, as well as some of the, the, uh, the contemporary events that are happening right now. Where would you like to start tonight? I think that uh, you have to begin with... Uh, the background we have already, and also with the fact that the Seventh-day Adventist denomination today, uh, to whom I addressed my questions, responded quite differently than the denomination in 1956. How so? Um, in 1956, um, Reuben Figure, who considered questions on doctrine and the dialogue, he said, to be the most important single contribution of his entire tenure as president. Mm -hmm. Ruben Figur began in his later life to deplore the fact that there was a strong movement within Seventh-day Adventism to undercut what they had worked so hard to establish in questions on doctrine. And um, so I, after a number of ex-Adventist ministers came to me, after I received literally hundreds and hundreds of letters, documents, boxes full of documents from all over the world, Australia, New Zealand, England, the United States, you name it, they're stacked up that we had to go through. 
uh, with people doing research on this subject. And they all were telling the same story, these ministers and these people all over the world. They were saying, we believe questions on doctrine. We cited questions on doctrine. We presented our views in the light of questions on doctrine, and we were disfellowshipped. We were removed from the church. Uh, uh, I'm now painting houses, and I was a former teacher. I was doing this. Now I'm doing such and such. What, what went wrong? So I thought it would be a good idea to ask the question, what went wrong? So I addressed three questions to Neil Wilson. Who is the president, uh, the president of, the of the General Conference? Okay. Mr. Wilson didn't have time to discuss it with me, so he referred me to somebody else who didn't have apparently the time to discuss it either, and they referred me to somebody else. By the time I did get a response, the first question, I asked three questions, three primary questions. I asked them uh, the question that I thought was tremendously important, which is, uh, do you still hold the questions on doctrine? And the answer was, yes. Same as uh, Mr. Johnson has said. Uh, I thought, that's strange. Uh, all these people can't be wrong, or something's wrong in the communication system. Second question, do you regard the teachings of Ellen G., the uh, interpretations of Ellen G. White of the Bible to be infallible? That is, the infallible rule of interpreting Scripture in your denomination. If, for instance, an issue comes up uh, where you're debating something, mm -hmm. and uh, Mrs. White speaks on it, uh, is that the infallible voice? Is that the end of the debate? Is that, is that it? Uh, that question was conspicuously left unanswered. Um, and I was referred to uh, other materials which was rather super, were rather superficial. And um, I asked... Uh, a third question, uh, asked them about uh, questions on doctrine and uh, why the book went out of print. And uh, since then, I have formulated now a whole new series of questions. All right. Uh, go ahead and just, uh, Colleen, Nikki, I'll let you decide who wants to go first. What are your kind of, what are your immediate thoughts on that clip as we kind of jump into the second part of this conversation? Well, First of all, the answer to the question that was left unanswered is absolutely, she is the last word. Um, not just doctrinally, but in practice. We have, we don't have Sunday school, we have Sabbath school in Adventism. And you go to any adult Sabbath school class where they're debating mm. an issue, and it's the guy who says, Sister White said, that has the last word. The room goes silent, the issue's dealt with. Mic drop. I would love to read a quote to you from Ted Wilson, the current president of Seventh-day Adventism, the son of Neil Wilson, who would not speak to him. This was writ or this was actually shared in a Sabbath message on July 3rd of 2010. He said, the same spirit that moved the holy men of old has again in these last days raised up a messenger for the Lord. My brothers and sisters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, the Lord has given us one of the greatest gifts possible in the writings of the spirit of prophecy. Just as the Bible is not outdated or irrelevant, neither is the testimony of God's end-time messenger. God has, I'm sorry, God used Ellen G. White as a humble servant to provide inspired insight about scripture, prophecy, health, education, relationships, mission, families, and so many more topics. Think bite model. Let us read the spirit of prophecy, follow the spirit of prophecy, and share the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is one of the identifying marks of God's last day remnant people and is just as applicable today as ever before because it was given to us by heaven itself. As God's faithful remnant, may we never make of none effect the precious light given us in the writings of Ellen G. White. And just to dovetail with that, later in that same sermon, he also said this about Ellen White. While the Bible is paramount in our estimation as the ultimate authority and final arbiter of truth, the spirit of prophecy provides clear, inspired counsel to aid our application of Bible truth. 
It is a heaven-sent guide to instruct the church in how to carry out its mission. It is a reliable theological expositor of the scriptures. The spirit of prophecy is to be read, believed, applied, and promoted. Let me repeat a conviction of mine, a personal conviction. There is nothing antiquated or archaic about the spirit of prophecy. It is for today and until Christ comes. This is the man who is still at this moment the president of the General Conference of the Seventh-day Adventist Organization, and I kind of refuse to call it a church. That's why I say organization. (laughs) What's up, everybody? It's the Super Sleuth here, here to ask you a really personal question. Are you single? If you are, I bet you are tired of those Christian dating websites that treat people like a commodity rather than being made in the image of God that they are, meaning that you're endlessly scrolling through results and sending messages to many people that have no substance. If that's you, here's the best solution. It's called HigherBond.com. They are built for Christian people who value their faith, right, as the guiding force behind every decision in life. This is real Christian dating, guys. They send you batch matchmaking results, three to five people per day, but you can only choose one person to send a message to, meaning that you're actually taking your time to get that message sent. And if you're struggling with sending that message, they actually give you guided first message questions that you can actually ask through them in order to give you a conversation with substance. Hirebond.com is also offering three months free right now. No obligation, no credit card information. Go to hirebond.com forward slash cultish and sign up today and become a member. It seems that when he's uh, describing this, it's it's subtle because I'm just, again, it's like, hey, the Bible is good, but... Like when you're reading that, I mean, I'm hearing that for the first time, I kind of had an idea of where it's going. It, it seems to me that he's not saying, like, thus saith the Lord, quote unquote, but he's saying, like, you need my, uh, it, you need my exegesis of it. So he's not just exegeting the text for the sake of exegeting the text. Uh, Andrew, you guys are going through John right now, right? That's correct. Okay. So, I mean, you think about with uh, Pastor Wade, when he's going through there, his his goal as a pastor is just to tell everyone this is what God's Word says, not to say my commentary is authoritative. That would be a red flag for sure. So there's a distinction there. Um, yeah, that that's what it seems, he seems to be implying there, that it's it's my comment, my sort of prophetic commentary or exegesis mm-hmm. of God's Word. God's Word is infallible, but my prophetic exegesis of it is what you need me to have that to get a thorough understanding of God's word. Is that what he's implying in that quote? For sure. And, and, and he says inspired counsel. He, he doesn't mean that the way that some might take it. He doesn't mean it like she's a wise woman who has wise counsel for us. He means God took her to heaven or showed her in vision things he wanted us to know And so she has a direct word from the Lord and all of her counsel on food, on marriage, on child rearing, on clothes, on anything. And she says even her letters that she writes to people are inspired by God. All of it came from heaven. So it's more than commentary. Mm. Right. There was a, I'm sorry. (laughs) There was an ad hoc committee at the general conference who wrote in the Adventist Review and in Ministry Magazine in um, 1982, and this is right after they had uh, developed the 27 fundamental beliefs, which have now become the 28 fundamental. So this this statement came out two years before the Walter Martin interviews with John Ankerberg, and they said, we do not believe that the quality or degree of inspiration in the writings of Ellen White is different from that of Scripture. I was actively taught that as an Adventist. She is inspired just like the Bible writers. Hmm. Yeah, and if you can get your hands on their 28 Fundamental Beliefs book and you start with that first chapter on the Word of God, the the whole chapter is written to prepare you to accept Ellen White. Mm -hmm. The way that they talk about how the Bible was inspired and, and to what extent it's inspired and what kind of room is there for errors. They set the stage. They even use great Mm -hmm. controversy words, you know, talking about the controversy between good and evil. And they're setting people up to believe Mm -hmm. scripture is Mm -hmm. similar to her. 
Yeah. So right. Real quick, just very, very quickly, because and this is a fire hose of information for a lot of people. Maybe we could give just a very quick Cliff Notes LinkedIn bio summary of two different terms because we're talking about LNG White being the authority. Remind everyone what the uh, great disappointment was, but also the investigative judgment, because those two things are very part and partial indicative of LNG White's authority. Uh, just very, very quickly, give everyone a quick reminder of that. Okay, well, the great disappointment occurred on October 22, 1844, when William Miller and his followers, who were expecting Jesus to return that night, were disappointed because he didn't return. Right. And the, there was a small group of people who coalesced into what became the Seventh-day Adventist organization, mm -hmm. and they said, oh, no, we didn't have the date wrong. I, no, what they said was... <laughs> We didn't do wrong in setting a date, and we didn't have the date wrong. We had the event wrong, mm -hmm. where William Miller eventually said, I was wrong. And other people left the movement and either went back to their churches or spun into agnosticism, whichever. These people said, but, but we want to make a statement. So they had... Um, they had a couple of visions, Ellen White's being the definitive one, but the first one being by a man named Hiram Edson the day after the great disappointment where he supposedly saw heaven opened and Christ, this might sound like, uh, you know, gobbledygook, and it is a little bit, mm -hmm. going from the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary into the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. And he opened the books of heaven and started going through the records of all of those who professed Christ, not mm -hmm. the unsaved, those who professed Christ, and finding out if they had been keeping the law, if they had confessed all their sins. And that began what is known as the investigative judgment, which is currently, according to Adventism, and Alan White is the one that established this, going on today in heaven. And this is the one unique doctrine of Seventh-day Adventism that is not shared by any other organization. And the, the end game is that when Jesus finally finishes going through all the records of those who have professed Christ, he will take all the confessed sins of those who have confessed all their sins, even their forgotten ones, <laughs> because the forgotten ones can keep you out. He will place them on the head of Satan, the scapegoat who will go into the lake of fire and be punished for them. So in the end, even Satan is the final sin bearer. Adventists mm. won't say it that way, but that's the function. Hmm. Wow. Did that help? Yes. Very, yeah, that's very, good. Very much so. Andrew, did you have a I, question? Yeah, I have a question with regards to uh, the spirit of prophecy in that quote that you're reading earlier. So how, how do they talk about it now? Like if, if Hebrews is one of their definitive books to go to in the Bible, right there at the beginning, it says, Long ago and many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers through the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, right? We just hold on to that yeah. statement. But when we have Ellen G. White, if the spirit of prophecy is supposed to be alive today in the Seventh-day Adventist uh, organization, we find that she had over 5,000 articles, 40 books, about 25 million words, right? Yeah. Over 2,000 visions and dreams. Uh, <laughs> so, so much. Like in some of these visions were four hours long. So yes. how is the spirit of prophecy alive if that's not occurring anymore. And I, I, I find this interesting because even in the LDS organization, we have Joseph Smith, a bunch of visions, right? A bunch of things. Uh, but he was one of the only ones who actually had many of them, right? Like there's other right. revelations with the ending of polygamy, quote unquote, and the blacks entering the priesthood in 1978. But on t but before all that, like the main bulk of it was all Joseph Smith. Right. So it seems the same way with Ellen G. White. So how can you say the spirit of prophecy is alive if nobody is having visions or dreaming dreams? How do they how do they get around that? And how do they explain that to their members? I mean, if I was part of the SDA and that was supposed to be one of my fundamental beliefs, I'd be like, well, what's going on? You know, why, <laughs> why aren't I seeing something? You know, I wondered that. I wondered that, but Ellen White said that we we represent the Church of Laodicea in Revelation, and Laodicea is a lukewarm church. And so I thought, well, we must be in the last days because no one's prophesying. But they they canonize her. They won't say they do, but they do. Her words are living. They ha she has a quote, and this quote appears on the screen when you go to the ellenwhite.org website to look for her online writings. And she has a quote that says, my words will live on. They are kept on file, and long after I am dead, they will speak as long as time shall last. And she calls them living. Mm -hmm. 
would this is also we talked about this in part one. That would be indicative of why even after her passing, while she is still main the primary source of authority versus other similar organizations who have fragmentation upon the death of the leader and who their successor is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just to uh, confirm. Uh, yeah. So another question I have when it comes to uh, that John Ankerberg show between Walter Martin and they're definitely going back and forth for sure. Um, what was the overall takeaway like after that was complete you can again if you want to watch the that whole conversation just look up youtube look up on youtube a walter martin seventh day adventism and walter martin seemed to be very gracious but very assertive that there's a lot of things that were problematic with questions on doctrine people were being fired uh it was no longer being published by the seventh day adventism there are questions he'd stay at the end there's specific questions uh that they meticulously left and unanswered what was the fallout of that show, uh, of that meeting, versus when Walter uh, initially met with the Seventh Day Adventist all these years? When what was the fallout of that show that happened? <clears throat> Excuse me, that happened. I never heard about it until I left Adventism. Me neither. Not did a word. Did not know it happened. Really. Really, did not know. It's really pretty brilliant. They don't address their critics. They don't acknowledge them. They don't let their people know that they're out there. If you happen to fall upon them, they'll have conversations with you. In fact, I believe they have a book that they've written or a study that they're doing with Adventists who discovered Dale Radslav that that goes step by step through the book Cultic Doctrine. And they're able to retain members who are starting to have questions. So they have a plan in place for dealing with it, but it is not a public matter. They won't discuss it. I knew nothing about John Ankerberg. I didn't even know he existed until I left Adventism and saw this hmm. video. I, yeah, yeah, they just don't say and anything. It's, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because, you know, Adventism didn't know about Walter Martin. They didn't know that they had been removed from the classification of cult and they were so proud. But the fact is, um, <clears throat> Adventism historically suppresses the reality of Christians and their activities in the world. Mm -hmm. I I did not know until I left Adventism about, for example, um, Jim Elliott Hmm. and the Alka Indians. I had never heard that story. That was in the news back in the day, about Mm -hmm. the time of Walter Martin, I might add. So I didn't know about a lot of Christian missionaries, didn't really know about William Carey, didn't know, you know. Did you know Corey Ten Boom? I did. You did. I, I didn't know about Corey yeah. Ten Boom, but they don't talk about this because they don't count if they're not Adventist missionaries. Would it be the same for hospitals? That's interesting. You mean? I'm sorry. How do you? Well, mean? there's there's a lot of seven. You mentioned there's a lot of Seventh Day Adventist yeah. hospitals. There's also a lot of uh, charitable Christian organizations. You think of the history, mm-hmm. the Christian history behind the Red Cross, for example. That uh, specifically, mm-hmm. I think they're called Mercy Ships where they go alongside the shore of Africa and people that have like cataract issues with a cleft lip, they'll just oh, yeah. do just scores and scores of these operations. They're just Christian organizations all around the world. I mean, I don't know, maybe that's, they only view, well, only Seventh-day Adventism are doing that, but that's not in light of all the other Christians. There's emphasis on that. That's on really TV. interesting. I didn't know that the Red Cross was a Christian organization as an Adventist. And I didn't know about the, the mercy ships. Mercy ships. You know what we did have in Adventism, and this is what's played up. They have the whole, besides their their extremely prevalent missions program, they have a hugely active missions program, mostly health missions, by the way. But they um, they have a program in their schools, both in their secondary boarding academies, but especially in their colleges and their medical centers, like Loma Linda, of student missions, where they send their students on <clears throat> short-term mission trips with the school and um, they call them mission trips, but they're, they really end up being excuses to travel. The people, you know, they find themselves going to exotic islands and African nations they would never go to otherwise. And it ends up being a place where, for example, dental students can perform uh, operatory procedures that they are not allowed to perform in the United States because of licensure. So they can go on the mission trips, they can get all this experience and do things that they're not allowed to do here without the same kind of supervision, but they're called, you know, mission trips. And then they, they kind of reel people in with the 
with the health message, which is their, quotes, right arm of the gospel. Isn't it true that right now in Africa, they're offering people free health care if they join the Adventist church? Is that Africa? We recently heard about that. We recently heard that. I don't remember the details and I can't remember exactly what the circumstances hmm. were, but I did hear that. Yes. Yeah. But we heard a lot about ADRA, which was the Adventist Disaster Relief Association. And so whenever there was a disaster, the Adventists would go in. And so we'd get reports back on all of that. But we really didn't know what was going on in the Christian church. And in fact, hmm. Uh, when I left and people would recommend books or sermons by very well-known pastors, I had no idea who they were talking about. I mm -hmm. didn't know. Yeah. No, that that's good. I, I appreciate you sharing that. Um, so what, why don't we just do this? Uh, we, we're going to have our own sort of version of questions on doctrine. Uh, Andrew okay. and I, we're going to, we're going to have, we're going to just kind of go through, uh, Andrew, you did some research here. And so I want to set this as a catalyst. So when we're looking at, um, what define what makes an, something a Christian organization versus a non-Christian cult? You know, we look at the basic fundamental essentials of the faith. You know, justification by faith alone, uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, uh, specifically the deity of Christ. And I think one of the main dividing lines is, is described perfectly in Second John uh, one verse nine. And I'll just read the English Standard Version. Uh, this is anyone uh, who goes ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. So even in that text, there's a distinction. I actually like the translation that says that run anyone who goes too far. I think that's a more accurate depiction. Sorry for interrupting your currently scheduled programming, but did you know you can go to apologiastudios.com and become an all access member? With all access membership, you get exclusive content from all of Apologia Studios productions. Not to mention Cultish is an Apologia Studios production. So you'll get access to Cultish, the aftermath where Jerry and I talk together after our most recent series discussing what we thought. It's really cool. We have a lot of fun doing it. And, you know, we can't do this without the studio. It keeps the lights on. And we can't also do this without you. So please go to ApologiaStudios.com and become an all access member. Now back to the programming. So Andrew, uh, you had written out in your super sleuthing, because I had you focus in on this uh, last uh, the week or the week before, uh, Christ's human nature, sinful or sinless. Tell them about some of your research you did and, and then let them know well, what questions do you have for Colleen and Nikki? Um, yeah, uh, the question would be is what do you Seventh Day Adventists truly hold today, right? When it comes down to the brass tacks of what they teach, do they believe that Christ took on a sinful human nature or do they, do they believe that he was impeccable, uh, which was without the ability to sin and not in a fallen human nature? So I actually have a quote here directly from the book, 28 Fundamental Beliefs. And this is on the chapter number four, God the Son. And they pose that question. Could Christ sin? Christians differ on the question of whether Christ could sin. We agree with Philip Schaff, who said, had he, Christ, been endowed from the start with absolute impeccability or with the impossibility of sinning, he could not be a true man, nor our model for imitation. His holiness, instead of being his own self-acquired act and inherent merit, would be an accidental or outward gift, and his temptations an unreal show. Carl Ullman adds, the history of the temptation, however it may be explained, would have no significancy. And all the expression in the epistle to the Hebrews, he was tempted in all points as we, would be without meaning. They believe it's ridiculous to think that Christ was impeccable in his human nature. They might try to say he had the pre-fall nature of Adam. Some of them say that since questions on doctrine, before questions on doctrine, probably no one would have said that. But since questions on doctrine, and they morphed the, the teaching on the nature of Christ. But the fact is, here's where they fall off the boat, and nobody talks about it because it's, it's an assumption underneath Adventism that most Christians don't know to examine. The issue with Jesus is he was fully man, but he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He did not have to be born again. We who inherit the spiritual death of Adam 
primarily and Eve, you know, but Adam is the one credited with our spiritual death. We who inherit that have dead immaterial spirits, according to Ephesians 2, 1 to 3. We're born by nature, children of wrath. Mm -hmm. So we have to be born again. So for an Adventist, that is not even on the table. They don't even know to talk about that. So when they talk about Christ's impeccability or not impeccability, it's all example. It's all he showed us how to do it. He showed us how to avoid sin by prayer and depending on the Holy Spirit. And if he could do it, hmm. so can we. And because everything's so physical, even in the in the fundamental belief book on this same chapter, they they say that Adam had an advantage that Jesus hmm. didn't have. Yes. Because he was born into paradise. So he didn't have 4,000 years of physical deterioration in his body. They see sin, inherited sin, as being um, essentially genetic. Something you inherit from your parents. That's why some people kind of get a tendency to alcoholism and some people get tendencies to other things. It's just the 4,000 years of degenerate human nature and it comes in through the gene pool. So then the fix has to be physical as well, because the sin is physical. In John chapter 3, when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, Nicodemus misunderstands what Jesus is, sh- is saying, and he says, well, can I go back into my mother's womb? I'm a grown man. Is that indicative of how Seventh-day Adventists misunderstand being born again, given their commitment that everything is material? I would say yes, yeah, but I would say that there is a significant difference, and that is, which I didn't understand as an Adventist, it was later that I started to see, when Jesus said to him, are you the teacher of Israel, and you don't know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And it was was after we left that I realized, of course, Nicodemus knew the prophecies in Ezekiel that said, I will put a new spirit in you, and I'll put my spirit within you. (laughs) I had never heard those texts as an Adventist. So Nicodemus did have some knowledge of the prophecies. Yeah. But yes, he took it physically. And and that's why they have to redefine the idea of being born again. They can't completely dismiss it because it's in scripture, but they talk about it as a like a a mental ascent, a renewal. So when you get to that chapter in this book, they talk about being born again. And then even again, if you need to, if you fall away and you come back, you can be baptized and be reborn again. Yeah, every it's a time, do-over. Yeah, it's a do-over. Every time you sin, basically, you can be born again again. How do they interpret John 1.14? The word became flesh and dwelt among us. I mean, the world, be, the, the immaterial became material. So you have something that's fully immaterial, but also fully material in the beauty of the incarnation. How, how do they interpret uh, John 1.14? Or does the, is it the clear word? A Bible? Yes, yeah, it is the clear word. Does that give any sort of interpretation on John one fourteen, or what are your thoughts on that? Oh, I'm not even sure what it says. Or just as doctrine, an Adventist. Just, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. As an Adventist, I, I knew the text. I uh-huh. think it was even a memory verse. And I understood that Jesus was God and that God became man, but that was a kind of a qualified understanding. I mean, I understood that he gave up a lot of his God qualities. I did not understand this Colossians text that said the fullness of deity dwelt in him bodily. Mm. So the uh, whole kenosis idea for me as an Adventist was he gave up his ability to really know what people thought. He gave up his omnipresence. He gave up even his omnipotence, you know, unless God granted it to him for a moment. So he became just like us. And I was actively taught that he had no advantage we don't have. So when he met a temptation, he was on an equal playing field with us. And what he did, we can do. And, and there's there's a background here that I think is really important when we're talking about the nature of Christ. Ellen White had this vision. I think you referred to it, this four hour vision called the Great Controversy Vision. She had it at the funeral, at a funeral. <laughs> and in this vision, she saw that there was a war in heaven before God ever created Earth. And that Satan accused God of being unfair because he gave them a law that they couldn't keep. So it, The assumption is that the Decalogue was in heaven, that the Ten Commandments given to Israel were actually in eternity past. And so I'm not sure how the angels dealt with adultery. That's another topic. But he he said God's law wasn't fair. 
And so God sent him out. He didn't want to come across as being a dictator. I'm summarizing. And so he decided he was going to let this play out on earth and watching worlds, watching creatures, not just angels, people on other planets. We're going to watch this play out on earth to see if God is fair and if his law really can be kept. And so Jesus comes and he provides a way for us to get the spirit so that we can now keep the law and vindicate God to watching worlds. And the so, spirit is power, not so if, if Jesus comes and he's able to keep the law because he's God, well, that's not showing God's fair because that's God keeping God's law. We need to show God's fair. We need to show that we can keep God's law. And so Jesus comes in sinful fallen nature and he is able to access power from the Holy Spirit and he is able to keep God's law perfectly. And now because he's died and he sent the Holy Spirit, we're able to access that same power, provided we don't grieve him away with our sin. We're able to access that power and keep God's law and vindicate God to these watching universes, watching people and the people here on earth. And what this actually ends up doing in practice is reversing what the New Testament teaches us about the gospel. The law was intended to increase sin and to show us we couldn't please God. That's mm. the purpose of the law. And Jesus came and did what we couldn't do. Jesus came and lived a perfect sinless life because he had spiritual life from the moment of conception and yeah. did not have to be born again. He is the perfect sacrifice. He perfectly paid for, for our sin and took away the tool of the devil, which is the law mm. by which he could accuse us. He fulfilled it. It's no longer a tool in the hand of Satan. But Adventism completely reverses it and says, we come to Jesus and then we go to the law and find God. Wow. Instead of the law takes us to Jesus hmm. and there we become alive in Christ. It reverses yeah. it. I've got I mean, one. Go ahead, Andrew. It, it reminds me of, it's a, it's the complete opposite of 2 Corinthians 5.21. Uh, it says, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. If I were to be the person who is using inspired commentary and creating the clear word Bible, <laughs> I would change this to be like for our sake, in order to uphold the commandments of law, we are shown that Jesus was himself fallen yet perfect in the ways of the law so that you could too to inherit righteousness later. Yeah. Like that's kind of what the belief is that I'm getting here with the great controversy, this pre war that or not war, but this, a uh, this argument yeah. that happened prior in heaven. Uh, Jesus was showing people that they can do it because he did it. But that's the point of the gospel is that you can't do it. That's why he came to do it, <laughs> you know, so you can inherit his <laughs> exactly. righteousness. So that's a, uh, that's pretty intense, man. That's intense. Uh, so another question on doctrine I have real quickly, uh, pun intended, of course, uh, when it comes to, because now you're mentioning the law and, you know, it's interesting because you have a group like the Hebrew Roots or other organizations who have a distortion of the law that ends up being a burden and a weight. And maybe we can get into that in a little bit. But if we really kind of dig into it at its core, if we really unroot this at the core, at the root core of all this, would the uh, how they apply the law be it the sabbath dietary restrictions every aspect of that does that fundamentally come from their misunderstanding of the godhead of the trinity and of the just of their category areas between the material and the immaterial i would say absolutely related because number one if you have a physical god um, if you have a physical Jesus, if you have a Jesus and a, and a Lucifer who are closely enough related, Ellen White never actually said they were both angels, but she implied it very strongly, and that Jesus is exalted to be the son, that the law was present in heaven before creation, then everything is measured by performance, by activity, by obedience, by function. And Ellen White was shown... <laughs> that the Ten Commandments are in heaven with a golden halo around the Fourth Commandment. So the Fourth Commandment is the seal of God, which marks people as the ones who will be saved when Jesus comes back. Mm -hmm. If you're not keeping the seventh day, then, you know, but this is all related to the physicality of 
of of reality. I mean, you should hear the conversations about, well, what if you live really far north and the sun doesn't set for months? You know, what do you do with the Sabbath then? It, it's a very physical thing that creates a lot of logistical issues. And Ellen White's answer to that question was, well, there are better places to live. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. I mean, like even in even in heaven, how do you obey the Sabbath? I mean, uh, well, yeah. Yeah. I mean, unless it's a physical place near Orion's she, belt or something. But she I guess. insisted. <laughs> yes. And she insisted yeah. that there would be days and weeks in heaven and that we were taught and great controversy says God will keep the Sabbath with us for eternity. I mean, never mind the fact that eternity has nothing to do with time, but that's not how we learned eternity. We sort of learned eternity as the endless time. Mm -hmm. It was all physical. Interesting. And Go related ahead. to the food, I just want to say this. Um, Richard Rice has been on the faculty of religion at Loma Linda University for years. He retired two summers ago in 2020. And in 2009, he was interviewed in um, a movie called The Adventists, put out by Journey Films. And this is a little quote. There's just a little clip of this. You can actually find it on YouTube. Um, Richard Rice, professor of religion, says this. Speaking of the Adventist focus on diet and health, doctrinally is kind of interesting. I think it may be related to another aspect of Adventist belief. And that is the fact that human beings are essentially physical. That is to say, there is no part of us, like a soul or a spirit that lives independently of the body. So we are physical beings from beginning to end. And the future beyond death is a resurrection of the body. It is not an immortal soul that keeps on living. So once you've emphasized the body to that degree, then you begin to realize that taking care of the body is an extremely important thing to do. So, yes. Yes, the health message is all about physicality. Oh no, that's no, that's very, very. Uh, this, I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, next category of a question on doctrine uh, is the atonement. You need when you uh, just uh, so when you think about that, and Andrew, you did so. I'll let you uh, jump in with what questions you have about your research. Just the thought I have, real quickly. There's a combination of the of the material and the uh, immaterial when it comes to the atonement. You have Jesus Christ, who's God come in the flesh, who died physically on a cross, physically shed blood. We, you think about all the accounts of the crucifixion and all the, the gory details, but there's also something spiritual that was happening as well, too. Mm -hmm. The Father was turning you know, his face against the Son. All his wrath was being poured out in him. And now all these years later, uh, us sitting together, we have our sins are forgiven in exchange for the righteousness of Christ— so we're physical beings, we're material beings, but we also have the righteousness of God's Son who died 2,000 years ago, who's now sit at the right hand of the Father. So you see that blending, in, and this is fundamental Christian orthodoxy. We, we've only known each other for a little bit. We've talked in passing a couple times prior to this episode. This is doctrine we're in uni uniformity on for sure. Where does... Sure. what ha What is the atonement like in Seventh-day Adventism, and what... What, from your perspective, makes it a deal breaker that would put it into the category of a non-Christian cult? Where do you begin? Right. <laughs> well, um, jump in anytime, Nikki. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> because this is the complex thing. This is what this is one of those two complex things that stump the writers of questions on doctrine. Mm. The fact is that Jesus's death in Adventism was a physical death. Period. They. Um, I understood his physical death to be a representative death. In fact, I recently read that quote in one of their Sabbath school lessons, uh, which they circulate to the whole world on the same Sabbath every year. You know, they, they all learn the same thing. That his death represented Jesus's um, forgiveness of, of human sin. So it wasn't literally, I never heard as an Adventist anything about imputed sin and imputed righteousness. So, I mean, I heard the words, but I, it wasn't explained to me that way. So when Jesus died as an Adventist, I thought of him basically doing a demonstration. He was demonstrating that sin was that bad that we would kill God, 
that sin was that bad that we would let an innocent person suffer, that he was that good that he would suffer without crying and weeping and condemning and being and swearing. And that um, then he went into the grave and um, God sent an angel and finally said, your father calls you. And it was an angel who called him out. So the spiritual reality was basically, it was a symbol. It was a symbol and it was like a starting point. It's like, if you believe Jesus died for you and you say, okay, I believe that, then you have like the ticket to get in. Like you can buy a ticket to Disneyland, but if it rains or you get deathly ill, you won't go. Mm -hmm. So we could buy in that Jesus died and he suffered innocently, but it didn't mean we'd be saved we had to actually replicate his obedience that made him worthy to be a sacrifice in order to be saved. It was an example. His death was an example primarily. Now they might say it was a substitute, but it was primarily an example. Well, and it, it was a, a step one, a step one, <laughs> or mm -hmm. I don't know. It was definitely plan B because they didn't know Adam was going to fail. Really? They didn't right. plan for it for this right. until after he mm -hmm. had already fallen. Yeah. Um, but I, I think my answer to that question, I have such a hard time knowing how to answer that because yeah. I'm so very aware of the fact that the Adventist Jesus is a different Jesus. Right. right. So when I, when I try to think of him and, and the Adventist Jesus and what he did, having any kind of reflection of what my Lord did, mm -hmm. it, it's like a completely different subject, but yeah. he, the Adventist well, maybe, Jesus. Uh, how would a how would a maybe how would an Adventist then think of the atonement? You're you're talking about how you think about it now, sure. given your Lord. This was your mindset prior to this, or like an average person. Say you're someone's messaging you. You guys okay. get messages all the time from active Adventists, for example. I'm sure, mm -hmm. maybe who are asking questions. How do they view the atonement? Like when well, like what's their mindset when they're talking about Jesus dying on the cross? Terminology difference. How does the Adventist think of that? He made a way. He made a way. And so, um, and depending on how much you know about the investigative judgment, because after the whole questions on the doctrine thing, it wasn't taught as clearly to the right. younger generations, but you would either believe, well, both groups would believe that Jesus was in the tomb dead, dead on the Sabbath, honoring the Sabbath, keeping yes. the Sabbath. And so there was no deity that was anywhere. When he said, today, you'll be with me in paradise. The comma was in the wrong place. He was telling them the truth that day that eventually he would be with him in paradise. So Jesus is dead in the tomb. And then, like you said, the angel calls him out. And when he resurrected or when he went back to the father, he brought his blood with him. Yeah, and where, kind of. where he then is applying it in the investigative judgment. Yeah. And if you confess every sin and you remember to confess every sin, then that sin will be blotted out with his blood. But if you return to it, you know, it's no longer blotted out and that will stand against you. And you will not know. You will not know if you've been saved. You will not know until you've been resurrected and the investigative judgment is over. God will then tell you whether or not you made it. And so to say that I'm saved, when I told my sister, I'm saved. I know I'm saved. The God saved me. I'm going to be with him forever. She called me arrogant mm -hmm. because in Adventism to say that you're saved is to say that you've attained perfection and their entire chapter in um, the fundamental beliefs book where they talk about, they call it the experience of salvation. Yeah. It's not even titled the gospel. Mm -hmm. The experience of salvation is really a long convoluted chapter on sanctification and the perfection of your character so that you can be fit for heaven. There are some progressive Adventists, especially here in Southern California, who um, find that whole business of the blood being applied to your sins ongoingly to be a little reprehensible. So they teach here, some of them, <clears throat> that Jesus's blood paid for everybody's sin at one time everything. So we are born under the forgiveness of the blood. Everybody's born forgiven, but you can opt out. You don't have to follow Jesus. You can choose not to honor him. And that way you will not be saved because God wouldn't force you to be saved, you know. So they it's a sort of a form of, of universalism from which you can opt out. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like either that or that. <laughs> It's not the word atonement is very vague. And um, 
the cross is a bloody mess that's really embarrassing for Adventists. They don't know what to do with it. And Ellen White actually said, wrote, it's a sin to say you're saved. So all of this, all of this is confused because they don't understand the new birth. All of this is confused because they don't understand they're spiritually dead. Mm-hmm. We didn't understand what the big deal with Easter was. No. Why are the Christians so excited about Easter? It's pagan. Yeah. yeah. The resurrection meant nothing except a promise of a body coming out of the grave by and by, and then you'd find out whether you were going to be saved or lost. And so it was really a little scary. Hey, what's up, everyone? We love that you are enjoying our content on a weekly basis, but this program cannot continue and wouldn't be possible without your support. So if you want to go to thecultistshow.com, there is a donate tab. You can either support us one time or you can become a monthly partner with us that will allow us to continue this program, allow us to continue to be salt and light to the kingdom of the cults. So please go to thecultistshow.com forward slash donate and you can support us one time or monthly. Also, make sure you check out our merchandise store. Go to shopcultish.com. You can see all of our great designs. A lot of you have gotten merchandise from us already. So again, either go to shopcultish.com and check out all the awesome merch. Back to the show. Andrew, um, um, you did did a lot of research. I've been taking a look at a lot of your uh, super sleuthing notes. (laughs) What were your observations? And in light of what they're saying, what questions do you have? Yeah, I mean, they pretty much explained uh, the research because, you know, they <laughs> they lived this. So uh, my, my question would be is, like, what is their definition of atonement? Like, we, we know it as the reconciliation of God and humankind through the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ. There's like a reparation payment that uh, took place, for example, with Jesus Christ, his death on the cross, the sacrifice that happened where that was enough to please God through faith in Jesus Christ, by the grace of God, I can stand justified through the righteousness of Christ when I stand before the Father after my death because solely of what Christ did, there's peace that is brought about through this relationship between God and man. Like the atonement is simply that. It's a reconciliation, which means it's final. Like Jesus says on the cross, it is finished uh, with his work. Like, if, if you add anything to that, like Paul says in Galatians, you don't have the gospel anymore. There is no atonement. So my question is, is because I know there's a lot of people that are probably listening to this too, and maybe they're, SD, they're, they're SDAs and they're like, wait, but, but, but I believe that, you know, like, is it possible to be a seventh day Adventist and in, in believe in that atonement, but also then not believe that you have to worship on the Sabbath? Because I see that as a, a fundamental distinction. I talk to a lot of yeah, LDS people and they say, no, we believe in grace. We believe in grace. But then I ask him, must you be baptized in order to be saved? Must someone lay hands on you in order to be saved? And they don't see the, the distinction. Is it the same thing with the SDA? Like you have to worship on the Sabbath. I don't worship on the Sabbath. Like, uh, well, the, the SDA, like, you know, on the Saturday, I don't do right. that. So right. according to them, I would have the mark of the beast. Um, yeah. Yeah. Is, is that... Can you be an SDA? I'm guess guess what I'm asking is, can you be an SDA and truly believe in the atonement of Christ consistently? Because if you say you have to do X or Y or Z, other than the work of Christ, you no longer have the biblical definition of atonement. I would say if you are an Adventist and you truly have the biblical definition of atonement, why are you still there? Because everything they say about God is is heresy it's yeah. offensive if you truly know god you know aw tozer said what comes into your mind when you think about god is the most important thing about you if you really know god you can't sit in the presence of of false teaching and be comfortable there yeah. so i would say if you're comfortable in adventism and you believe you have a biblical doctrine of atonement go find a non-adventist christian and study the bible with them and see do you really believe the same thing they do? Because the Adventists will tell you we believe the same thing, but we don't. <laughs> they don't really. You know, when, um, one thing I one thing I would say is that sometimes, like the the person Steve Pitcher that wrote that article about Walter Martin, true Christian who was deceived into Adventism on partially on the recommendation of Walter Martin, partially because he didn't really know what they meant behind their vocabulary. And when he finally started realizing what happened, he said, 
Adventism stole my joy in Jesus for 15 years and he left and he lost his family, his family, his wife abandoned him and Mm -hmm. kicked him out, put all his stuff on the front porch, essentially. So um, the fact is, people who are true Christians who are deceived into Adventism can know the true meaning of atonement. But when they start finding out, and we've talked to more than one Christian in this category, Mm -hmm. when they start finding out what Adventism teaches, it's like, what have I done? And they have to leave. Yeah. But I'm not sure if a person grows up in Adventism it takes a miracle of God to reveal that atonement. And it's only from it really, I've never known it to happen for an Adventist unless they decide they're willing to let go of their Adventist worldview to say, I really want to know what scripture teaches. Which is a really big deal because it's not just a worldview that you're losing. It's your entire culture because in Adventism, your teachers, your parents, your grandparents, your dentist, your doctor, your everybody is Adventist. Everybody. You know, one of the ways I've come to understand uh, it's kind of a picture metaphorical way of understanding Sabbath to an Adventist occurred in my head several years ago when I was in a women's Bible study and we were actually in the first and second Kings and we were reading about Jeroboam and how he set up the golden calves in northern mm. the northern kingdom. And I was reading um, a little historical footnote about those golden calves, and it, the explanation was this. The Canaanites did not actually call the calves their deities. They always made the calves carrying their deities. And their deities, <clears throat> the calves represented the power and the, you know, the, you know, the power and the the forcefulness of their gods. Mm -hmm. So when Jeroboam set up the golden calves, he did not put a god on them, a deity on them, because Yahweh was invisible. So Yahweh, Jeroboam still said he was doing Yahweh worship. He just gave them the golden calves to represent Yahweh. So they had something to, you know, think about. And I realized at that moment, that is the Sabbath to an Adventist. They will never say Sabbath is an idol. They will never say they worship it. They will never say they have to keep it to be saved. But their God rides on Sabbath. They won't say you have to keep it to be saved, but they will say you can lose your salvation if you don't keep it. Exactly. And if you haven't learned about it yet, you can be saved without it. But if you have learned about it, you can't be. Does the average... You will will be... No, the, does the average Seventh Day Adventist do they understand the like every doctrinal point that we've been discussing for the last forty minutes? Do they really even understand their own beliefs? I've noticed something uh, <laughs> in my experience talking with uh, Mormonism, with uh, in just you know, our ministry to the Mormon Church, <clears throat> is that there's been a progressive change where twenty years ago people really knew what they believed. You could go uh, on the streets uh, out at the Easter pageant, you could have a conversation. Little by little, I'm talking about is that Gordon B. Hinckley interview that I think was a catalyst for a really postmodern shift in Mormonism where he started to have to bring out their own materials back before we had iPhones where we could just store <laughs> all the information of the world on our phone. Um, we would have a whole backpacks full of their own materials. We had to almost to pre convert them to Mormonism <laughs> prior to explain the gospel to them. No, this is what you really believe. Is that kind of the normative when you explain these things about the atonement? I mean, this is the first time I've heard of that. And I've always heard about oh, Seventh-day yes. Adventists in passing. This is very new to me. What about them? Yeah. So, yeah. It, it, it was something I had to learn. Like I mentioned in our first interview together that so much of what I know about Adventism came from having to climb out to learn the truth. Yeah. So a lot of younger folks, they weren't taught the doctrines well, although I do get the impression that that with Ted Wilson, that they have material in the school system yes, now they're, under his they're reign. moving back towards it. But my yeah. son, you're, you know, your well, I didn't have it. No. But but I do remember a few times mm-hmm. where people tried to explain the, the chart of Daniel <laughs> and the investigative judgment to me, and it just sort of goes over my head. And I 
I held on to, you have to have faith like a child. So I really don't have to know this because children can't figure this out. So I just have to have faith like a child. So I'd use that text to justify not really looking at it, but I still held on to everything I was told. Mm -hmm. In fact, if I ever had a question, I would say, hey, what did Ellen White say about this? Or what do we believe about that? Mm -hmm. It, It was, so you don't necessarily know how to explain all of these doctrines, but each person's going to have their own cocktail of what they know and don't. Yeah. This last Friday, we published a story from a young 30-something woman in Brazil. <clears throat> and she has just been discovering what's wrong with Adventism. And I really believe she's been born again. She tells how she heard the gospel. She writes like she is born again. She, And she said she now understands that Um, It doesn't matter whether you've heard Ellen White, whether you think you believe in her, whether you think she's a prophet, you can think you've completely dismissed her. She said, what I see now is that Ellen White is in everything you believe. She is the creator of the worldview. She is the creator of the definition of reality. She's the creator of the hermeneutic for Bible study. So no, the younger Adventists don't all know. Although, as like Nikki says, there are younger ones like in the 20s and early 30s now that do know more than the 40-somethings do. Mm -hmm. So in other words, like Ellen White sort of lives in their head rent-free? Yes, yeah. Totally. In fact, it's it's kind of funny. Colleen has often said that for some of us, Ellen White came in on the mother's milk. Yeah. And that was true of me. I didn't know how I got what I got in my head. I it's yeah. kind of a fun, a fun little thing to say, hey, is this from Adventism? Is this from Ellen? And figure out that yeah. there's actually a quote mm-hmm. that will explain mm-hmm. why that came down to me somehow, whether it's around the table at a dinner with the family, yeah. listening to adults right. talk. It's just everything. And it's not just about religion. It's reality. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's reality. It's like the sky is green. Yeah. No, that's blue. No, it's green. Speaking of touching everything, when you're uh, in contact with people who have been touched by Ellen G. White, I mean, this is organ- This is a, it's almost in every single known nation throughout the world, Seventh-day Adventism. When mm-hmm. you get, what are like, so the messages like, are there people who are actively, who are leaving, who are questioning, who are just mad and they want to debate like what's the nature of the contacts that you get is it kind of all of the above or what's that like for mm-hmm. for you all yeah it's all of the it's above. all of the above mm-hmm. the people that write to us that email us generally have questions mm-hmm. although you know there are some that just want to make trouble yeah they they write as well but um as nikki has said previously well over 90 percent of the people who leave adventism leave to go into agnosticism or atheism because if that version of, if that version of god doesn't work then nothing can mm. so it's a miracle when god reaches in and grabs us out i mean it just i yeah. i really feel like we're watching miracles when people come and say help mm. me figure this out when yeah, people... there's nothing like nothing like it yeah go ahead no and when people are having doubts as well too I'm sure you get those type of messages. What what typically is this kind of that straw that broke the camel's back or just maybe the the first initial kind of paradigm shift where all of a sudden they start to question? I mean, you have that you both experienced that personally. Mm-hmm. Like what mm-hmm. is there is there kind of a commonality between anything like in Mormonism a lot of times it's the book of Abraham translation or it's. Uh, oh, well, hmm. Galatians, maybe. Galatians, That yeah. might be the most consistent. They read Galatians. And those who don't read Galatians, um, it's hard to say. The cognitive dissonance sometimes starts with, um, you know, trying to figure out, trying, well, actually trying to figure out how they know they're saved. They are, they live with so much anxiety, so yeah. much anxiety. And like a friend of ours who's now with the Lord who'd been a neurosurgeon, an Adventist neurosurgeon. He'd spent his career that way. And he came out of Adventism and became truly born again as a result of getting stage four prostate cancer and figuring out, I've got to figure this out because he said his patients, his Adventist patients died so badly and his Christian Mm -hmm. patients died with peace and he couldn't figure it out. Mm -hmm. So I would say a lot of times it's the anxiety partly. People just losing control of their lives because they're so anxious. Yeah. And then it, it also seems to come up in family settings where yes. um, maybe before they get married, they they consider themselves liberal Adventists. They can, you know, go out to a restaurant on the Sabbath. That's kind of a no, no. And 
they're living how they want to. And then they have kids. Mm -hmm. And now all of a sudden they're responsible to indoctrinate their children and protect them from Babylon. And one of them will buckle down and know we need to go to Adventist church. And the other one will, you know, start questioning it. And that's a really, that's heartbreaking when we see that families splitting up or um, I find often it's, it's the, this is just, and I don't know. I might be wrong about this, but it seems like often it's the husband that's more patient with the wife uh-huh. in the coming out process. Um, it, it's kind of a matriarchal system, I would say. It and so quite feminist under the surface. Yeah. So the, the, the women will, will tend to be more willing to just cut it off if, mm-hmm. if the husband is, is leaving. It just seems like that to me. And then the husbands who are patient with their wives will often see success. One of the things we see, surprisingly often is we get letters from people who are not Adventist, who are Christian, who started dating an Adventist Mm -hmm. because the Adventist is so religious and spiritual and we have all these things in common, but then they start, you know, visiting each other's churches and the non-Adventist, you notice the terminology, it's like Mm -hmm. non-Adventist, not our people, not not us. Right. They are the ones that start to think, well, you know, they're, they're normal Christians, but the Adventist starts getting insistent. Like, well, this is where we need to go to church. I can't keep going to your church too. Mm. Yeah. And when we have kids, it has to be this. And Ellen White said that Jesus would come back. And if the, if the kids were not Adventist, he would look sorrowfully at, at them and say, Where's thy flock, thy beautiful mm. flock? Yeah. And the parents would be blamed. Yeah. When it comes to people who are ex Adventist, uh, say whether it's a uh, male or female, I know, for example, uh, there's a lot of other cults that are very like legalistic with how, how you dress, how you can wear your hair, uh, those sorts of things. When a lot of people, when they leave those sort of sorts of cults and they not not to say that this is justifiable, I think, but at some level it's understandable. A lot of them swing, do a pendulum swing, especially women who leave a, a destructive cult like that, where say they want to act out or be promiscuous and be able mm-hmm. to kind of do all those things because now what want to I'm quote unquote free, but I also want to vicariously rebel against the mm-hmm. system that was enslaving me of sorts. Is there any mm-hmm. sort of similarity when it comes to? Adventism, because even from my perspective, like from the outside looking, even even prior to our conversation, I did see things within the organization at least being problematic as far as being legalistic, uh, aside from this theology that we discussed. Uh, what's that like? Yes, that is absolutely a dynamic. Um, my husband left Adventism for a time when he was a teenager, clear until he was an adult. And he got all the piercings and grew his hair out and got the tattoos and everything that just devastated his parents. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, there's definitely, there's definitely a a pushback from all of that. And the drinking too is a big deal. A lot of drinking problems. You know, Mm -hmm. it's a very interesting thing. Speaking of that, Um, in our ministry, our purpose is to help these people questioning Adventism to become firmly grounded in Christ. It's not enough to leave the organization. In fact, for years, you know, I, I've prayed that God would not just bring people out of Adventism, but he plant them deeply in his word. That's the only solution. But if they don't do that, this push, this swing back is really, really profound. And one thing Richard and I have noticed, it's the funniest thing. You know, um, there's a lot of internal joking about now we can eat the bacon and, you know, yeah. all that. but it's the, the, the formers, even those who have become Christian have a tendency to like, okay, now I can drink. It's not, okay, now I can have bacon. It's mm-hmm. really interesting to me that the, the drinking is an issue. And, you know, just because we do this ministry, Richard and I just, we have an alcohol-free home. Just not because we think we shouldn't have alcohol. You mm-hmm. know, the Bible right. clearly says don't drink to be drunk. But it's because we're not going, we're just not going to provide an environment where we'll toast the new year together because I don't want to be seen as giving somebody permission to go out and go home and have yet, you know, six more drinks. I, and and I think too, part of what is at play here is that these people have been traumatized. Exactly. They were raised in unreality. Mm-hmm. They were raised in a cultic system and they didn't know it. Yeah. And so 
there's a lot of trauma that comes from that that is unresolved and undealt with. And that will drive kind of some of these rebellious and addictive behaviors. Right. Escapism, you know, it's trying escapism. not to yeah. feel it yeah. and, and living. And I've freely. often, you know, we've often said to each other, haven't we, that the Lord shows us the truth about himself. He brings us out of this incredible twisted reality. Yeah. But then comes the work of discovering through the Holy Spirit's work of applying scripture, the truth about ourselves and our own lives. And we actually have to end up looking at the legacy of our Adventist backgrounds and families. And I mm -hmm. have to tell you, there is a ton of abuse in Adventist families and in the whole Adventist system. Yeah, Not dealing with sin, pu pushing, pushing teachers who are, you know, doing sexual abuse to kids or other teachers, just side sidelining them to another school where it can happen again instead of firing them. That kind of thing is very common. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of trauma and there's a lot of need to become grounded in the fact that the Lord has taken care of that in the atonement. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. You know, I have a, go, go ahead, I have Andrew. A, yeah. I have a, a question. It seems like there's like a path that can, that can be that someone can go down when they're leaving the SDA, it's either the great disappointment 2.0, like all of a sudden mm -hmm. finding out this whole foundation of your life is a lie. Mm -hmm. And then you it's reject all of it. Mm -hmm. If the, if the SDA organization isn't true, if Ellen G white isn't true, nothing is true. Go down that route. Yeah. But yeah. then it seems that there's also that possibility of the, the great amazement of salvation, you know what yeah. I mean? That can be discovered yeah. through Jesus Christ. Do you find like, for example, with people who come out of the LDS organization, that's just kind of my context. That's when I can kind of compare it to, which they're all, they're pretty similar. Not going to lie, but um, they are. <laughs> yeah, uh, usually the people coming from uh, the LDS organization have a zeal, right? But the, the scriptures mm -hmm. would say they have a zeal, not according to knowledge. And I would as assume that would be to be similar within the SDA. There's people with so much zeal. So with the great disappointment 2.0, they can have a zeal for atheism, zeal for agnosticism, still not according to knowledge. But do you find that those who come to Christ are very similar to you guys, right? They have a zeal now according to the knowledge of the word of God, and they have a passion to reach uh, the lost because they know the system that they came mm -hmm. from. And do you guys help yeah. people try to uh, mm -hmm. obtain that in a sense or to hone Absolutely. that? Absolutely. That's why we're here. Makes me kind of emotional hearing you describe it that way. Actually, I feel a little teary because hmm. that's why we're here. There's nothing like a former Adventist Fellowship Conference when you have all of these rescued people coming together and yeah, rejoicing in the gospel. Well, they're annual conferences and they always have a theme. And we have uh, several speakers and apologists who come and have general sessions and we have breakout sessions. Uh, it's from Friday morning until Sunday after church. And I guess we have a, a potluck in the afternoon, but always President's Day weekend. Yes. Mm. And and we go through unpacking Adventist doctrine and replacing it with the true gospel. And people come from all over the country, all over the world and cry together, laugh together, pray together, rejoice together. And every once in a while, we have someone come in and try to convert us back and they're in the wrong place for that because yeah. they get blasted with truth. <laughs> Sometimes they leave early. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you feel like a lot of times in a, when you're, I mean, you would probably account, this was your experience and probably a lot of others too, when you're going through kind of the, the rethinking and the deprogramming or all of a sudden, you know, you have the other edge of the looking glass or you have that paradigm shift in the midst of everyone else. That's now all of a sudden you're on the same page with them. Now you're thinking the opposite way. There's this, real dualism between thinking like I'm crazy, mm -hmm. like I'm losing my mind when oh, it comes. Yes. So when it comes to a conference, is there like this relief? Like, Oh my gosh, I, I yeah. thought I was the only one. I can't believe yeah. this. Yes. Tell us Huge. about that. What are some examples of that? Oh, it'd be hard to pick one, huh? Well, it would. You know what um, time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would say though, that, that, that comes through with the podcast as well. We get a lot of emails with people saying, I spend every week listening to you and I feel like I know you and I don't feel crazy. I've been out for 20 years. I didn't know I still believe these things. You know, we have a weekly Bible study on Friday nights that we've been, Richard and I have been co-leading since 1999 and we're still doing it. And now it's also with Zoom since COVID, but mm -hmm. we have in person as well. And it's the same thing there. People will join us and, um, 
suddenly they will start asking questions. They'll start to see what the gospel says. They'll start to see the contrast between what the words of scripture are saying compared to how they saw their proof texts as mm-hmm. proof texts. And um, there's just an overwhelming, I, I can't believe it. I felt so alone. Um, there's other people like me. We had one woman who came with her husband who had never been Adventist um, to our Friday night Bible studies for about three years. She had been out for 14 years, was going to a Christian church. And um, she remember Sharon, she would sit, she would sit in Bible study and she'd go, oh, <laughs> no, I didn't know that. Oh, I remember that. Oh, mm. you mean that's not true? Yeah. And it had been 14 years in a Christian church. And now she doesn't come on Friday nights anymore, but she still comes to the conferences. She still writes to us. She's really active talking to Adventists and to the people in her church. It's like the fire has been lit and she sees the difference. Hmm. And then and then there's also the Sunday lunch. Every Sunday, Richard and Colleen open up their home to former Adventists and really any Christian who wants mm-hmm. to come and have lunch. And I remember... The first time I talked to Colleen on the phone, I said, so what do you do after church? You like go to Home Depot? It didn't make sense to me. What does Sunday look like? (laughs) And she said, come to our house. And so when my husband and I drove there, I expected when we came around the corner that there'd be a car or two. There were cars all the way up the street, all the way around. They have a horseshoe driveway all the way around the driveway. (laughs) There were a couple of Harleys or motorcycles that I thought was so (laughs) cool. I didn't see that in Adventism. And in the house, you you had to like walk sideways to get through a room. There were so many people who came to know the truth. And it was like a family reunion, mm-hmm. even though you've never met. Yeah. Hmm. We, we lose, when we leave Adventism, we lose a feeling of community. And I realize now I call it pseudo fellowship yeah. because it's, it's around untruth. But, you know, Adventists say, well, you know, we can go anywhere in the world and we can find our food and we can find people who believe like we do and we can find Sabbath school. But now we have family in Christ. And that's the hardest thing because many of us really do lose family. We really do. Even if we don't completely lose touch, and many do, Mm -hmm. um, there's a wall if they're not Christians, if they're not born again. It's like, what do you talk about? There's a hostility. But the Lord said he will give us a hundred times what we lose in this life with persecutions. Hmm. <laughs> and we, he does give us family. I mean, yeah, like, we're I, sitting here and we're talking to two brothers we've yeah, never yeah. met in person. I know. <laughs> but it feels like he's given us family. Yeah. yeah. Like, I think about, and I appreciate you sharing that so much. Like, I remember, like, one of the driving forces behind cultish was seeing shows like Scientology, The Aftermath. Mm -hmm. or um they did a series on uh, jehovah's witnesses and seeing Mm -hmm. and uh, there's other documentaries that are out there that shows the disconnect from ex-cult members of the when they go through the abuse but when they get disfellowshipped disconnected they become a suppressive person and seeing the grief and the severance and the trauma that goes through that but the only thing these groups have in common these support groups have in common is the fact that they've they have a shared trauma like you've mm-hmm. been like both of you have been through some things and seen some things mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. You, you know people who are going through those things too but you have something that those people don't have which is like the joy of christ where even in the midst of persecution tribulation even being misunderstood like that's one of the most hurtful things like being misunderstood yeah. by people that you love and care for and want to know the truth. And you know, like there's nothing I can say out of my mouth. Like I can't hold down the truth that's in my heart and mm-hmm. I want you to know the truth, but everything that's coming out there, there it's just, just a different language to them because they don't understand. Yeah. Yeah. And like the fact that you're sharing this, it just, it really touches me just because this is something that's the real, one of the main missions and catalysts of cultists from from its inception is to be able to show people who are in ex cultists we don't just want them to get out of the cult yeah. we want them to jump out of that burning building but we want to be like the firemen like with that little net to hopefully catch them yes. by god's grace yeah yes yes yeah very well said I- 
And I mean, that's why it's so important to us that you guys would do something like Mm -hmm. this series, because, you know, we've talked a lot about Walter Martin and some of the stuff that went on in the 50s and in the early history of Adventism. And but um, sitting where I sit, it's for me, it's where my family lives. Yeah, it's where my siblings are. It's where people I I really care about are trapped Mm -hmm. and and several have friends who are not Adventist, who are Christian, and their Christian friends don't know anything other than the fact that, oh, they, you know, have some food things and they go on Saturday, but, but you know, we're, we're fine, they're fine. And, and I feel like my loved ones are cut off from the gospel. That's the phrase. And cut so off from the gospel. to have Christians caring, yeah. it's going to it's going to mean a lot down the road as as one by one these people begin to see what's true because there are other Christians who are saying, now, wait, I heard something. Mm-hmm. Help me understand what you believe about this. And then they can take them to scripture. Yeah, man. I love that scripture so much. Wrote, yeah, the, it's the funny Bible. that mm-hmm. I'm sorry. No, no, you go. You go. You're good. I was just going to say real quick. We often say it's really kind of funny that God must have. It's as if God knew what all the heresies would be because there's an answer for every one of them in the Bible. Who knew? I love it. I love it. Like it literally says, regardless of uh, what maybe even your guys' families positions is, uh, believing in the soul or the immaterial, the beautiful thing is what the word of God says is actually true. Like in Hebrews 4.12, it says, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and the spirit of the joints and marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Right. So regardless of the beliefs of a false system, it's not true, but we know that God's word never returns void. It accomplishes exactly what it's supposed to do. Like you supposed to do. Yeah. Like you said, um, God knew all the heresies, right? (laughs) But what that means is that, yeah, that what that means is he knows all of the answers, right? And what what we need to do is just be faithful with the word, give the word and rely in faith on God right? Trusting in him and his will in order to have peace in our lives and joy in the midst of suffering. And then pray for our loved ones, pray for those who are in other Mm -hmm. false assemblies and just see how God works in our lives. Like you said, there's now people shoulder to shoulder, like essentially in your house, God is doing things. He literally Mm -hmm. split the soul and the spirit, a miracle occurred and he brought someone to saving faith. They were born again. It's the exact opposite of SDA doctrine, what you see together of these people. Exactly. Like even though Ellen G white failed, God never failed and he never will fail no. to bring about no. his kingdom. Like Matthew 18 or Matthew 28, 18 through 20, God yeah. is essentially giving the great commission to the disciples. He doesn't say now command them to observe the Sabbath. No, he's, <laughs> he he's telling them to preach the gospel to them, that the kingdom of God has invaded earth because now there's a spiritual redemption that occurs through the blood of Jesus Christ, where you can worship God in spirit and in truth, not on this <laughs> mountain, not in that mountain, not at that church or necessarily at that church with regards to one specific localized organization, right. giving you a body of truth, but worshiping, worshiping in what? In spirit, spirit and, and, and in truth. truth. And it's an amazing yeah. thing that we have through Jesus Christ. And that's, that's the gospel of the kingdom, right? To go, go and preach that, let God do his work, cutting in between the soul and the spirit and bringing to people about knowledge of saving faith. That's what the Holy Spirit does, right? Convicts the world of sin and righteousness. And I praise God for you too, because you uh, are that voice, right? Like God working through you to be that voice to people that are stuck in that false assembly. That's how God works through his people. He says, how beautiful are the feet that spread the good news. Mm-hmm. And he has shaped you and your whole life and your experiences to be able to speak to this certain group of people that he can speak mm-hmm. through you in love. And that's, that's great. I love that so much. Thank you. Thank you yeah. for that yeah. encouragement. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I, f- I feel like we've really covered every- like, this is good. I feel like this really sums it up. <laughs> um, Maybe I can just ask one last question as we wrap up here, and maybe you can kind of give me both your thoughts or go it together. I want to just read one uh, verse that just came to mind. I felt prompted to read. To read. Uh, this is Luke chapter 4, uh, verse 18. Uh, this is where Jesus goes and he picks up uh, the scroll from Isaiah, and he reads this mm-hmm. passage. He says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery 
for the sight of the blind to set the oppressed free <laughs> I'm on the internet and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor being the entire journey both of you have been on both being a, a seventh day Adventist now being on the other side what is this verse like wh- how does how does this passage resonate with you and your mission of why you both are doing what you're doing with uh, both your ministry and being on this podcast. It's a perfect text. (laughs) It is. The Lord sets you free. You know, you find him, you find the truth and the truth sets you free. And, and it, it, it is a prison, you know, even if you don't know you're in a prison, it's the prison to be in a false system that is, has created walls all the way around you, preventing you from knowing God. And Christ came to destroy all of those walls and all of those barriers. And that's, we we pray that through this ministry that we're able to help him break down those walls. Mm -hmm. You know, that text um, I find really meaningful in a way I don't know how to explain because as an Adventist, I, I read the words, but it never dawned on me that Jesus was saying, that was a messianic prophecy. <laughs> Here I am. Here I am. And as an Adventist, that just didn't mean anything to me. Here I am. And he stopped short of the day of Jubilee, you know, the passage in Isaiah that requires. So he's, he's saying everything he said up to what I'm here to do now is done. And I didn't realize that's what he was saying. And I, and I just think it's so amazing that he is alive. He is the, the object and the subject of, of prophecy of the Old Testament. And he has come and has taken away that veil of the law that Second Corinthians 3 talks about, setting us free. The captives, we were captives under the law. And his fulfilling the law and setting us free is a paradigm shift in all of history. And he's brought us into that, and he, this is the work he's created in advance for us to do, Ephesians 2.10. It's just amazing to me how it all fits together. I didn't see that unity between the old, the new, Jesus, and those who are his body. Hmm. It's amazing to me. No, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, all right. Well, thank you both for uh, coming on and uh, doing this long-awaited uh, extended series <laughs> with us, the two chapters. Uh, four episodes in total. Um, real quickly, as we are wrapping up here, one last time, where can people find uh, you both and your ministry, your podcast? Tell them about that real quickly. You can go to proclamationmagazine.com. You'll find back issues of the Proclamation Magazine. It used to be a print article. So it's there in PDF form. And we also have weekly blogs that come out. There are transcripts for our podcast, links to our podcasts, and links to our YouTube channel with videos from past former Adventist Fellowship conferences. Yeah, and if you want to email, you can write to former Adventist, that's singular, former Adventist at gmail.com. Excellent. Okay, we'll have, and also we'll, we'll make sure that we share, have links uh, in our descriptions too when this episode drops. All right, well, uh, if you, I'm sure you already have, but uh, you don't really need our permission, but go ahead and comment on our social media. Let us know what you thought. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be getting lots of DMs, both positive and negative about this, but I'm this sure is an important, it's, it's important that we have a conversation about this. So we appreciate you taking the time to discuss this. And as always, as we wrap up here, a program like this cannot continue without your support. There's a lot of uh, hours uh, put into this conversation from its inception to its completion. Uh, people who are producers in the back, cameras, all that sort of stuff. So I would ask to prayerfully consider uh, supporting our ministry. Go to thecultishow.com. There is a donate tab. You can ta- you can donate one time or monthly tax deductible. Uh, all that being said, we will talk to you all next time on Cultish, where we enter into the kingdom of the cults. Talk to you all soon. <laughs>